All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our West Coast folks, or we've had some people uh, joining from all over the world. So whatever time it is for you, uh, welcome back to uh, ABYC's uh, Thursday afternoon webinars here. Uh, this is number five for us, and we're going to keep doing this for the uh, foreseeable future. It's, it's uh, been a great thing. Our members have been loving it, so we hope you enjoy uh, this one today on the model year 2021. A couple of items I wanted to go through before I toss it up to the other two guys on the screen, which is Craig Scolton, our tech VP, and Brian Goodwin, our uh, tech director. So they're going to be giving the presentation today uh, after I go through a couple things here. So going through some of the similar things we've done uh, week over week, here's we're still uh, in the same waiting pattern here, all working from home. Uh, we're all working really hard to do what we can do for the industry, whether it's develop new content, uh, some of our online classes, which I'll talk about. Um, each department is working in overdrive to support our members and the industry as a whole. So we hope uh, for the members out there, you see the benefit. And if you're not a member, please uh, take a look at our membership and see what kind of value we'd bring to you. And we'll gladly answer any questions. So uh, we're continuing these and I've gotten some great topics. And one of the topics that we're gonna do next week is based off of one of the recommendations. So keep sending them in, uh, we really appreciate it. All right, for CEUs. So if you're looking to get your continuing education unit uh, at the End of the webinar, if you're watching this on YouTube, a link will pop up. You can click there and apply for credit. Uh, if you're watching this live, welcome, and uh, you'll be able to apply for the credit in the automated follow-up email that you will get tomorrow. If you have any questions with that, uh, you can email education at abycinc.org. Uh, any questions during the presentation, please enter them in the question box uh, as time allows at the end. I will read them off to Brian and Craig. And if we don't answer your question today, feel free to reach out to them and they will gladly answer it. If you're having audio problems, uh, you can always dial into the phone number if your computer audio isn't working. So uh, that's always a quick fix for that. Some of our online resources. We have our standards online certification. It's a self-paced program. Really great. Uh, give it a shot if you're looking to get that certification now. Um, I'll mention it again. We have a great partnership with A Media, uh, who is publishing our uh, academic textbook for free. So if you're an educator or know someone who's teaching marine service, uh, you can send them to teachboats.org or they can email us at education at abyc.org uh, for some more information on how to get that free textbook for their students. Uh, self-study, if you would like to get any of our certification on the self-study study model, you can purchase the study guide and you can proctor from the comfort of your home using our proctor use service. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions on that. Uh, we have a few sales still going on. We have our free micro courses uh, as well as our basic electrical and corrosion mitigation course and our essentials of outboard service, which are both really, really great educational courses. So you can get that on our website also. Our interactive online classes. It says interactive electrical certification, but we sold that out very quickly. So we do have a systems class that you guys are the first to get the announcement of uh, starting on May 26th. So we're gonna start this interactive class following the same format. And if you're on the wait list or we're interested in the electrical or any other of our certifications, uh, we will be doing more of these in the near future. So we're looking to get some things scheduled out in the next couple weeks here. So keep an eye out on your calendars because we will be doing more of these interactive learning classes. And we got great feedback on our first one. Uh, it's going really, really well. So I'd encourage you to take advantage of this time if you're looking to get our certifications and uh, check out those uh, interactive ones. Flash sale, we have a handful of these left. So if you were looking to get one of these uh, Blue Sea clamp-on multimeters, uh, there's only a handful left for sale on our website. It is on our top banner bar or on our store. So I encourage you to take a look there. Uh, once they're out, they're out. So uh, I don't think they're going to make it to April 30th. So go now. I think we've got less than 10, I want to say, left. So if you're interested, definitely check it out uh, at the end of this webinar. All right, next week, our next week presenter, we have Ray Toth, which if any of you have been taking one of our courses before with him, he's a great guy, ton of knowledge, and he's going to be talking about batteries. So battery selection, type, install, do's and don'ts. It's going to be a really, really great topic. So definitely tune in next week uh, for that. And from that, I, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Brian and Craig, who can introduce themselves a little bit more and uh, get this webinar going. So I am going to drop off the screen here, and I am going to switch this over to you, Brian. All right. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we'll get the presentation queued up, and then let's get that going. I'm Brian Goodwin. I'm technical director here at ABYC. I uh, oversee basically uh, the standards review and development process uh, that's constantly ongoing and ever going. Uh, and uh, also we have 
Craig Stolton also. So I'm going to kick off my camera as well and let Craig introduce himself, and then I think he'll get us uh, started. Okay, again, welcome everyone. Uh, Craig Stolton, Technical uh, Director. Uh, I focus a lot on our international or uh, global presence of ABYC. Do a lot of representing of the U.S. industry amongst a variety of uh, technical uh, boards and uh, standards writing organizations outside the U.S. Trying to get more harmonization of the uh, ABYC requirements and what we do. So when you are building a boat here, uh, it also meets the requirements uh, in the rest of the world. So we're going to get into this uh, now, and this is focused on the 2021 model year. Brian, if you uh, can uh, get rid of the video part of it, we'll get rolling. Just a short disclaimer that this is, uh, again, an overview. Uh, it's for general guidance. It doesn't replace the uh, regulations, the CFR, uh, or the standards. And it's not the official compliance document. If you're ever in doubt, of course, always read those uh, regulations and standards. What is model year? Uh, that's always uh, a challenge for some builders in knowing when they can start. It is uh, in the uh, U.S. code, and uh, that's where the law comes from. And it begins on June 1 of a, of a year, of a given year, and ending on July 31 of the following year. And it's designated by those last two digits uh, in the HIN. Uh, it's simply a 14-month period where a boat can be first offered for sale to the consumer, the first purchaser of the boat. Uh, the month and year of build, uh, that's positions on 9 and 10, and recreational boats are required to have this certified in compliance. And what you're certifying to is a self-certification uh, to the CFR. And uh, that's the placard that goes on the boat that you make the declaration that the boat is in compliance with the safety standards in effect on the date of certification. And that's the month and year of bill. Model year. That's the start of the new model year. It can begin as early as June 1 of the current year. And here's an example uh, showing a F for the month of June uh, and zero for the year and the model year that you wish, 21. So if uh, manufacturers are putting the serial number uh, on the boat with a month prior to June, a code earlier than F, uh, you need to ensure you've got some sort of documentation that shows that uh, you've not offered that boat for sale to the consumer and make sure that uh, you and your dealer network have that documentation if you're challenged. Your best bet is to start with F that will throw no red flags to the Coast Guard. Uh, and if you do happen to have a product out there starting earlier than that, have the documentation that can show that it did not uh, retail sale of the consumer before June. This, the, the, the HIN, who's interested? The industry certainly is interested, whether it be the boat manufacturers, surveyors, the Coast Guard, financial organizations, of course, insurance companies. And some of the reasonings behind that, and as builders are getting ready to move into 2021, there's a perceived value that uh, certainly a newer boat is uh, worth more money and uh, banks will lend uh, quicker, uh, a boat buyer will think it's uh, more valuable, but originally and primarily uh, it continues to be the means of performing uh, recalls. Of course, it's used by states for registration and titling purposes, law enforcement, we get lots of calls uh, about that, where's the hidden HIN? And of course, the Department of Homeland Security uses this for a variety uh, of reasons. When is another uh, good reason for having this uh, month and year certification. There's a life cycle of standards and bolt manufacturing. Uh, when ABYC comes out with its new supplement of ABYC standards, you can start using those new standards when they're published. Uh, they do have generally a one-year effectivity, a transition period, 
Uh, but if you desire to use them when they're published, you can. But there is a date there uh, where new product and installations after July 31, so August 1st uh, of the referenced year in the standard, you need to be in compliance with that newest requirements in that edition of the standard. And that goes along again with that safety standards in effect on the data certification, whether it's Coast Guard or uh, EPA for that matter, has the same language in their evaporative emissions label. So what are we talking about here? Federal regulations, there uh, is just about a dozen of those main regulations that apply and they only really address specific issues. Most don't apply to boats uh, 20 feet and over. They really haven't changed much since uh, the Boat Safety Act of 71. There's no actual certification requirements. They take an act of Congress to change, of course, and really minimum and uh, recognition around the world. Where ABYC standards are much more comprehensive, they uh, apply in most cases to all boats. They don't have a length limit. They're updated on latest trends and technologies. They're a part of uh, various certification programs. Uh, we too can react correctly to uh, changes in the industry. And you know when you use ABYC, they meet or exceed the uh, federal requirements and uh, more and more international requirements every day. Here's an overview chart of the different boats, uh, their lengths, and the type of uh, fuel that they use. And that's really what makes up the differences here in the U.S. is uh, depending on the boat type, how long it is, and what type of fuel it has is going to give you the different CFRs that are applicable to the boat. One new one that's out, this is not new for 2021 model year. It's in force right now, but we wanted to make everybody aware of it. Uh, this was part of a Coast Guard Reauthorization Act. And if you've got a new recreational vessel, not an old one, not retroactive, but a new one, less than 26 feet, capable of producing more than 115 pounds of thrust. Don't know why that's changing. Then uh, you need to have an engine cutoff device. The compliance date was December 4th. Uh, the Coast Guard is looking for enforcement, again, utilizing those last four digits of the HIN. If that new boat ends A020, they're gonna be looking for an emergency cutoff device on that boat when they do their inspection. To try to make it easier for everyone as members, we put together a supplement of that annual update that comes out here. This overview document uh, tells you the standards that's changed and has a breakdown within this document of those changes. Works really well for uh, those in your engineering departments, quality control, procurement departments, uh, those in the prototypers. You can take this document and highlight the areas that they need to be concerned with and what's changed. That's on our, our library and uh, comes out each year. Uh, here is a snapshot of our online library where our standards are at, along with the federal regulations, compliance guides, uh, ISO standards if you subscribe, uh, and our global compliance work. So as a member of ABYC, you have 24 seven uh, access to this online library. Here is a screenshot of that library when uh, it's open. The supplement uh, is at the very top, this overview document uh, that I talk about. And there's also another uh, section there that we have highlighted in the red box, and that's related documents. And what that contains is track changes, uh, the previous standard, and any requests for interpretation. Uh, those are always very valuable throughout the year. Here's a track changes document. This highlights the sections of the standard that have changed. So if you've been uh, working in this case with the uh, firefighting uh, standard and you wanna know what's new and different, you can see that now a fire detection device or system shall be installed on boats with, and it goes into the particulars of what they have to be installed with. So this highlights those changes if you weren't familiar uh, with them beforehand. Here's a request for interpretations. I won't get into these, but it's a formal interpretation. If you have 
a question regarding the standard and what does it really mean? Many times staff can give you what that intent was. We were involved with the development process, but if it needs to be further defined, we go to the PTC uh, that handles that standard and we get an official ruling. The, uh, it has to be a question that can be answered yes or no, but uh, you uh, provide the question, we bring it before the PTC and get an official response uh, regarding that matter. The online library also has a global search. So in this case, if you're thinking about fuel filters and you want to know how many uh, examples that fuel filter comes up with, uh, it's going to search all the documents on the library, the federal regulations, the conformity guidelines, ABYC, ISO, all the related compliance documents will be uh, searched for that. And uh, there's a, a, a number of them that come up for fuel filters. It'll take them in order. Here's the law and what it requires for a fuel filter. So if you've got questions about ignition protection, uh, gasoline fuel systems, anything that uh, you can think of, you can plug it into the search and uh, it's a nice feature to see what all requirements do apply. I'm going to now hand it off to uh, Brian who's going to go through the actual details uh, within Supplement 59 of the standards that have been revised. Brian? All right, thanks, Craig. Appreciate that. Um, if you want, you can turn off your webcam on the little control bar up there. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm going to take us through uh, Supplement 59, uh, which was published July of uh, 2019. Um, just just some things. You know, you can see up here that uh, there was nine standards, three technical information reports. And it's always important to understand that technical information reports an informational document. Uh, it doesn't contain requirements. It's intended to provide education to the industry. Uh, and we also withdrew one standard. But it's important to know. I'm not going to touch on all the changes that happened in these in these standards. I'm just going to hit on some of the high points, some of the larger ones, because. Uh, as with 1,200 pages in the uh, blue book, as I like to call it, there's not enough time in the day to, to read the entire thing. So, uh, so, so the first one we're going to talk about is E2 cathodic protection, and and this one's right. We're trying to keep underwater metals uh, in the boat from sticking around. And, and if you want to learn more about that, you can check out one of our previous uh, webinars. John Eddy did his kind of uh, seventh grade science fair experiments where he, he looked at this and delved into it. But but E2 uh, was previously published in 2013, uh, published again in July this year and has a compliance date of August 1. So that's why it really lines up with the model year uh, 2021. Um, there were two RFIs on this, and, and this is really, uh, Kind of important because when you look at it, these RFIs answer some age-old questions of are you required to have a bonding system on a boat? And the first one gets into it and says basically as a manu boat manufacturer, if you install one, you need to follow E2. But if there's not one on the boat, uh, so so be it because there are some that truly believe in isolation. So uh, that was answered. Um, and then there's a follow-up question to that uh, because pretty much every outboard engine, uh, stern drive engine, has some kind of cathodic protection system on it integrated. And it's and well, if the boat has an outboard engine with this cathodic protection system, does that mean the boat itself has one and therefore has to comply with E2? And again, the answer there was no. So uh, a little information there uh, to, to get you started there. Um, there was an exception added in in E2, basically calling out uh, these submerged uh, bonding conductors that you typically find on engines, outboard stern drives that connect various parts. A lot of times it's uh, moved between, you know, various moving parts, um, the transom bracket and the actual engine itself to make that electrical connection. And and a lot of times the engine manufacturer is using stainless steel because of the environment that lives in there. Um, so it doesn't have to be stranded copper. It can be can be stainless steel. So that's that's called out. Also, we struck out the requirement pointing to TE4 lightning protection about uh, uh, conductor size. So something to know. Now, now one of the things in there um, sometimes you get isolated 
batteries in boats. So they, they added some language to deal with isolated batteries uh, in there to say basically, no, you don't have to bring that back and tie it in if you have an isolated battery. The other thing that we get a lot of questions on is what is the correct sacrificial anode? And, and you see in here this nice little chart uh, kind of calls out zinc, aluminum, and magnesium. Uh, and oftentimes you don't know where a boat's gonna go, but a specific requirement was added saying that magnesium sacrificial anodes shall not be used in vessels operating in seawater. And, and the big concern here is that magnesium is the least noble of the anodes and, and uh, it's the most anodic. And you're really concerned about overprotection in seawater and some of the consequences that could happen there. So uh, while we gave you the, the chart that said, uh, you know, it's not recommended, there's actually now a requirement saying don't use magnesium anodes. Yeah on a vessel in seawater. Uh, also, we added into the table, uh, just for convenience, a, a zinc reference, right? We always use the silver, silver chloride. That's probably the mainstay in the industry. But if you ever want to use that table, you can now use a uh, zinc reference cell also to get your, your millivolt shift on your bonding system to make sure you're in the proper protection range. Uh, a28 uh, ties the same line. We're talking about galvanic isolators here. This really separates the boat uh, from the docks grounding system. A and when you look at it, a uh, couple little tweak here, we actually increased the scope to go up to 600 volts. Previously, it was 300 volts. So uh, it's important to know. And again, we're trying to block low level DC current with this. Um, one of the other big changes is we took out any kind of requirements dealing with status monitor. And when you really go out and look to see what's in the industry, uh, most galvanic isolators are what we, we term and now require to be fail safe. So if they should fail, they're going to fail in a safe position. And in that case, it's actually failing in a, a closed position where it's going to allow all current to flow through. Uh, therefore, protecting any risk of electrical shock. While it will not be blocking uh, the DC current, it will be uh, maintaining continuity in that, uh, the ground system there. So for all you out there uh, looking and that are already familiar with the standard, I, I know we're kind of killing you with lots of words, so I thought I'd throw a picture up here. But you look at this picture, you kind of start going, what is wrong here? We got our green wires, we got our galvanic isolator. So real quick, couple things, uh, just for good knowledge, uh, you got a neutral ground connection on the boat. And we know because E11, that's not correct. That should be made back on at the source of power. All right, so we also have uh, exposed AC connections, right? You got a, that white neutral wire there. Uh, those should be made inside of an enclosure. And then did anyone see there's something kind of strange going on here down at the bottom? You actually have two conductors out here, and, and the way I interpret the way this wire diagram is, this is uh, going off to the shore, and you basically have bypassed with those two conductors. Uh, you've bypassed your galvanic isolator, so little uh, practical application there. All right, so moving on, uh, H1, field of vision from the helm position. You know, this was reviewed, a lot of discussion at the committee level. But overall, when you look at it, there were not huge changes to the standard, but there was an important RFI, Request for Interpretation. Craig talked about this earlier. And when you looked at it, the standard was very clear where the uh, vertical range of visibility was supposed to be measured, but it, it did not was not clear where the horizontal range was. And it, and it raised a question because you start to see some of the human factors on things, especially when you start looking at boats like center consoles of where the operator is. So they asked the question, uh, is the horizontal range intended to be uh, measured 16 inches after the center of the steering wheel? And the answer was no, it was not the intent of the PTC to require the horizontal range to be directly behind the center of the steering wheel. So this, uh, this RFI and interpretations out there, the standard is actually currently being worked on by the uh, whole performance PTC to further improve it for the next revision. What about H3, exterior windows, windshields, hatches, doors, port lights, and glazing material? Talk about a long title there. So again, uh, compliance date of August 1st, 2020, lining up with model year 2021. Uh, when we get into there, there, there is a revision to one of the definitions, the definition of a cooking appliance. And 
we kind of did this to try to harmonize uh, and also just to make it a little clearer. Uh, we're not trying to define every single appliance out there, but it's really, we're looking at a heat source. So a cooking appliance is an appliance intended to be used for the preparation of food that makes use of a heat source. Now, we have three examples up here. And the question is, which one of these is not a cooking appliance per this definition? All right, for those of you that picked the microwave, you are correct, that is not a cooking appliance. It does not use a heat source. It doesn't have a burner or an element that actually gets hot, it is uh, projecting microwaves. So per that definition, it is not considered a cooking appliance. And, and really where this comes into play into the standard deals with the means of exit, right? Uh, we, we talk about enclosed accommodation compartments or designated sleeping compartments shall have a readily accessible, unobstructed means of exit. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. And you have to have a second readily accessible means of exit to the open air if the main exit leads through or over an engine space or directly past a cooking appliance. So you can see in the picture to the left, there is a traditional stove. Uh, that is going to use a, has a heat source, has a, a flame, a burner. So that, that vessel is going to require a secondary means of exit, most likely, because I suspect there's a uh, designated sleeping compartment. And if you look on the picture to the right, you can actually see, you know, kind of the genesis of why this is so important. You have a stove here, uh, you get something such as a grease fire, uh, another way out, and you can see there is a, a a door just to the left of the flames that go back to an aft cabin, uh, and that would require a secondary means of exit. So, so we talk about that means of exit, and and the standard gets into defining what it is, and, and a lot of times those are hatches, and it's important to know the size, right? The standard has a definition, a minimum dimension of 14 inches, and a minimum area of uh, 27 square inches for odd shapes for circulars it is a minimum diameter of 18 inches but they added a clarification to this to really point out that uh, you shouldn't have other things in that area so circles should be inscribed after taking into consider any restrictions including hinges latches or stays so right we let's take a closer look at what that really means so in these examples in our uh, round hatch, it's minimum 18 inches. That's pretty straightforward. But the others, we look at it, and, and the example here, you can see you have your stay to hold the hatch open. Is that getting into that area uh, as well as the the dogs to hold it down? Do those do those things that the protrude out into it? Do they impact the the area? So uh, just on a side note, uh, right? If we say the minimum dimension has to be 14.5 inches. If we're looking at a rectangular shape, that means the other dimension has to be at least 18.62 inches if you're doing a rectangular uh, shape. So, And then also we added requirements uh, about the maximum vertical distance, right? Uh, what good is a secondary exit if you can't get to it? So, so we added a maximum vertical distance shall not exceed 47.5 inches, and a lot of times these these uh, points are above uh, mattresses or other um, soft goods. So so we even talked about that uh, of looking at compressed materials. So uh, we want to make sure if you look at the picture from the bed to the hatch that you are not exceeding 47.5 inches. Um, and we also moved the requirement that talks about being able to open that from both the inside and the outside. And we added some language about uh, when secured and unlocked, because the reality is there's times when we want these hatches to be locked for security purposes. Uh, construction. Uh, the standard always had, the, had this rope jam test in it, but it was never actually uh, explicitly called out and required. So, a requirement was added that explicitly requires this for all hinged hatches. So uh, it's something you may not have thought of before if you're looking at things in the cockpit. Um, obviously, people think about this on, on like a four deck hatch, but you also want to look at it from what's going on in your cockpit and other locations on the boat uh, with this rope jam test, as well as the hinge strength test in here. 
Uh, we're looking for the hinge strength. We're applying a force of 45 pounds, opposing force, and, and making sure the hinges can happen or withstand it without a without uh, failure. All right, so we're going to move on to H40 anchoring, mooring, and strong points. And again, couple couple changes here. Um, we added a couple exceptions because the reality is when you look at some of these loads, you you and they apply to like canoes and kayaks. I don't think so. Have you ever seen a canoe or kayak with a bow eye? I'm sure someone on has, but it's not common. It's not something that's typically applied as well as manually propelled boats and other uh, small low horsepower boats. So we added some exceptions there uh, into the scope. And we have our good friend, Captain Ron here to make sure we get through this safely. But one of the challenges that people were seeing, some of the, those loads get pretty high that are required. And we're talking about things related to the strong points that the standard calls out. And we added a note to really call out that this can be determined by a physical test, which was done, but you can also do it by calculation because there's sometimes uh, when you're looking at these loads, a calculation can be, can be done uh, with appropriate software to determine if, if you're gonna meet it. Also, we added a little language that to clarify that chalks aren't required but if installed they need to be able to uh, comply with the requirements of the standard uh, one of the other areas we clarified was uh, anchor stowed uh, used to used to say on deck and, and there's a lot of questions about well what does that really mean on deck so we really expanded this uh, because you know if you look at the picture on the right that's a pretty old methodology of stowing an anchor on deck and a uh, picture on the left is probably more realistic to what's happening to that so we wanted to make sure that while the boat's in under operation that uh, that anchor is not going to break loose or anything so we're talking about a five times the anchor weight in a vertical pull so you're looking at vertical meaning basically up and down so you're going to pull on that five times the weight of the anchor all right, so now we're gonna move on to P1, installation of exhaust systems for propulsion and auxiliary engines. One of the changes here uh, is we're really talking about where can these exhausts be on the boat? And we actually added a whole new area of basically underwater at all running speeds and conditions. And you might see this, uh, you know, in, in the example in there, this is a, a wakeboard boat where they added this too, because when you look at that, where is it on the boat? It's smack dab in the center um, where we don't want it. And, you know, we want it outboard away. Uh, there's concerns with carbon monoxide and exhaust from the engine. So, so you can see we, we've permitted this uh, underwater at all speeds and running conditions now. The other issue was brought up by an engine manufacturer, and, and you can see it right here, is, is really looking at overloading the boat uh, and basically flooding the engines. Um, so they we put in this requirement here that says the riser height above the waterline shall be maintained at maximum weight capacity, including, including full tanks, right? So we're talking ballast tanks, live well, fuel, and water, right? We're getting the boat basically as heavy as we can get it, and the riser wants to be above the water. Obviously, the boat in the picture, um, these guys are a little uh, beyond what they probably should be doing there. All right, uh, also, this is just a, a technical information report, uh, T24 Owners and Operators Manual, and it's important to know that uh, in here, there's a couple changes, and again, this is not a standard, this is a tech info report, so it's really to provide that guidance uh, we updated the, uh, it used to call it a declaration statement, and now we're calling it a compliance statement. And this is where the boat manufacturers are state uh, everything that the boat complies with. So as Craig was alluding earlier, right, you're complying with federal, federal Coast Guard regulations, you're complying with EPA regulations, uh, anything dealing with uh, Prop 65. Uh, these are all things that we recommend that you put in the owner's manual so that when the owner actually gets the boat, they can see the, this information as well as we overhauled the uh, owner operator responsibility statement because we all know uh, it's important to make sure that the owner understands their responsibility of operating the boat. And also we did a call out to aquatic invasive species. Uh, this is a, a growing issue in the US and around the world and ABYC developed a technical information report on it a uh, year or two ago, uh, T32. And we wanted to make sure that um, people developing owners and operators manuals are aware of 
that information. So with that, you know, I talked, I told you about some of the highlights, some of the big changes uh, that happened in this, this last supplement. But really, you know, I'm going to turn it back over to Craig so he can tell you, well, okay, now you know the who, what, where, when, but and how are you going to comply with it? So, so Craig, you've been build, used to be a you know boat builder for 30 plus years. How do you comply, and how can ABYC help you comply? Thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah, we'll get into the technical toolbox that ABYC is building and continues to work on to let you know as members what you have in your uh, arsenal to help stay in compliance. Uh, it involves our online library. We're going to cover that overview document, an audit tool, some templates, a global guide, and uh, then we too can offer some on-site compliance training. Uh, when the time is right, we'll be able to uh, bust loose from working from home here and we can spend time with you at your facility, going through interpretations of standards, physically doing testing, uh, and training you how that goes about. So that's one of the things ABYC offers is some on-site compliance work. But the one that uh, we've got uh, now that you can take advantage of is a compliance audit tool. This takes all the U shells from the standard, the things that you're going to be accountable for. Uh, let's say an accident happens and something occurs, someone's going to come back and see was this boat in compliance on the date of manufacture and what applied. So we took all those major requirements and put them in a checklist. This is now in an Excel format. And uh, if this particular uh, section didn't apply, there's a box you can check at the top, it's not applicable, and it automatically fills in all these boxes, not applicable. If there is a section that has got a light blue background, that means there's a test. You as a boat manufacturer should have some documentation in your technical file that shows you tested this. And what's new with sound signal appliances is that as installed, that sound signal device cannot be more than 4 dB below what it tested from the manufacturer. You test that one meter forward of that sound signal appliance where the horn manufacturer may have tested it at, at X dB on the bench and certified it, it can be no less than 4 dB below that. So having these sound signal de devices facing forward so the sound can come forward uh, is uh, important that when it's installed that it's not hidden or shielded. So this compliance audit tool can help you go through that 1200 pages of technical bliss and put it in a checklist format you can use as a surveyor or insurance worker or as a boat builder. You can share this amongst your design team. And where you get that is uh, right on our store. It's all part of our growing toolbox. It's free for business level and above members. You go to the publication section uh, of our store and you simply add this uh, compliance audit tool. Supplement 59 is the one that you'll use for 2021 20, model year. And you just add that to your cart and uh, an email will be sent and you will get this document via email uh, to your inbox. There are supplements up there for 57 and 58. So if you're working on an older boat, you're doing a survey on an old boat and you want to know what the requirements were at the time of manufacture, you can use those uh, older versions of the supplement uh, for the same kind of, of work. So testing, what's in your technical file? Within the standards, there's a number of these light blue highlighted sections whether you're determining if your battery box tray installation meets the two times the battery weight that it's required now, is your boarding ladder 22 inches below the water line? Uh, what's the efficiency of your ventilation system? And is your seacock installation strong enough? Does your transom door support 400 pounds going out? Uh, how well attached is that grab handle? Uh, this will all become very important uh, usually not if, it's when a situation is going to occur out in the field. So having a good technical file to be able to present uh, to whether it be an inspector or anyone else interested is important. So we've come up with some test report templates. This is an overview of all those templates. Uh, they're all linked inside of a uh, Excel document. 
And uh, if you're looking to determine uh, installation of items, whether you're determining cockpit drainage, something to do with fuel systems, anchoring as we've shown, uh, steering systems, there's a variety of blank test reports that you can uh, fill in. Again, right off from our uh, publications, you're gonna see another series uh, of test report templates. Add that to your cart and an email will come with those documents. They are blank. This one here has been filled in by Joe Boat Builder. Uh, what's real important is to have that observed. So his uh, good friend, John Boat Builder has uh, observed it. And here's some minimum data that you want to have in this report uh, that helps make it a, a good report should you need it. You're able to plug in your pictures from your phone and uh, show that on a given date with uh, various equipment that had been calibrated, you did a test. And then these reports can be used for a range of boats. If you've got a similar installation, like a battery box installation or a grab handle or a ladder that you're installing on a whole series of boats, a family of boats, then this test report could be used for a variety of boats if indeed those installations were all the same. So this gives you some tools to help build that technical file and using the standards as the basis of the requirement and the test description. If you're doing business outside of the United States, we have a technical advisory group that meets. I'm the chair of that group. We review uh, standards and issues going on around the world. We call ourselves the Global Compliance Watchdogs. Uh, we do a lot of work on ISO standards and trying to harmonize those requirements with what we're already doing. But we've created a little cookbook, if you will, a compliance guideline that uh, if you're sending a boat to a given country, uh, it's going to give you the highlights of what is required and different in that country. Uh, it's located again on the online library in global compliance. And it looks like this. If you're sending a boat to Australia, what is the law there? What kind of standards do they recognize? Is there a certification required? What about compliance documents? What kind of paperwork do I need? And the main systems that would always give the builders the headache of, is the fuel system different? Is the US one good enough or not? What about electrical? Well, I can tell you in Australia, electrical is challenging. There is a whole host of special requirements that we could do a, uh, a webinar like this on in detail regarding electrical in Australia. Uh, so components, engines, special requirements, the main points are all listed here in this global compliance guideline. And simply by clicking on the country, it gives you that data. So this technical advisory group, we're accredited by ANSI. We represent the U.S. builders uh, at, at these international meetings. And we have a 30-minute webinar each month. Uh, if you are on it as a member or even on the mail list, you have free access to all the ISO standards that are under development. These are the drafts that we're working on. It gives you an opportunity as a member to comment and vote. And it provides you, of course, and your organization with a, a really improved understanding of what the requirement is. Well, this is what it says, but what does it mean? And how do I really do it? Those same kinds of questions we get into in ABYC, this is more on the international side and under the ISO. So it gives you a real advance knowledge of what's going on as well. The ISO standards are on the ABYC library. It is a separate annual subscription. Uh, as a TAG member, you would have access to the drafts, but as a boat builder needing the most current ones, they are also available by subscription uh, on the ABYC library should you want them. Again, that's a store item that you can be purchased. Finally, Canada. Canada has a new alternative standard policy that's been approved, uh, and that is the acceptance of ABYC standards as an approved alternate method for small vessel compliance. It's not uh, just pleasure craft, but uh, really all vessels, it's pleasure craft less than 24 meters and commercial collapse under 15 gross ton. It was effective back last October, 2019. And whether you're manufacturing it, rebuilding it, importing it, surveying it in Canada, you can reference ABYC standards. If you've done your homework, you've got your technical file, you know you're already in compliance with E11, 
and uh, age 41 and age 24, some key ones, then you can utilize that on the declaration of conformity uh, as your compliance, not have to worry about a whole nother set of requirements. So we really have one set of standards now available uh, for North America. So I'm gonna turn it back to Brian. Uh, we've been talking about 2021, but uh, the standards are ever evolving. So we've got a whole new batch being worked on for 2022. Brian, can you take us through that? Sure, thanks, Craig. Uh, as you said, uh, standards are always uh, evolving. We like to call them living documents. And, and what you see on your screen are, are some of the ones that we are targeting for publication uh, this July. Uh, they are currently in, in the process and you never know, things may sometimes get them derailed at the last minute, but we're, we're, we're hopefully uh, publishing these. A uh, couple of highlights, I know that there's been a lot of interest in uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, that's gonna be a technical information report. Um, but that's coming out as well as another highlight is dealing with uh, P28 uh, electric electronic propulsion control steering control systems. Um, and that really, we took P24 and P27 and pushed them together because what you're seeing is a lot more integrated uh, shift and throttle and steering systems with joysticks. Uh, it addresses wireless controls, which would be a, is a new thing as well, um, as well as dynamic positioning. So these are all, new things that we're we're dealing with uh, to account for new technology so hopefully you'll see these published this july um let's move forward there uh and, and really people sometimes go well how, you know abyc is in this ivory tower and they write these standards and i can say that is probably the furthest thing from the truth our process is accredited by ANSI, the american national standards institute and we have 16 project technical committees. These are committees made up of volunteers uh, from the industry. Uh, our process is open to anyone that's materially affected. So whether you are a boat builder, an engine manufacturer, an accessory manufacturer, a surveyor, um, repair facility, work, do insurance work, you are you're welcome to get involved in our process. Uh, the first step, if you ever want to get involved, is uh, to join a mail list. And uh, being a mail list participant, you get the notices, uh, you can submit comments, you can attend the meetings, you just don't have the responsibility that members of that project technical committee have to show up and vote. So that's a great place to get started. Uh, you can learn the process. You really, as, as Craig was talking about the tag, you get a better understanding uh, of the standards and really being involved in the standards development provides you that opportunity to, to provide your input uh, and also gain that understanding of the standards development process. Is it a quick process? No, it is not a quick process. It takes about a year if everything goes according to schedule to review and publish a standard, if if subcommittees get formed to, to go uh, research uh, topics, it may take two or three years, depending on the level and scope of the work being done. Uh, but it's it's a rewarding opportunity to get involved. You meet great people in the industry. And our, our next big event, hopefully, uh, will be Standards Week uh, in Orlando, Florida, uh, July or not July, January 11 through 15 in 2021. So we're hoping all this uh, coronavirus stuff is through and clear by then and we can have our in-person meeting, but we also do a number of meetings online as well. So if you're interested in getting involved, you can you can go to the ABYC uh, website, you can click on the standards tab and, and go to the get involved page. You can fill out a little web form uh, and we will get you involved in that. Um, and that pretty much, I think, wraps up all of our highlights for uh, model year 2021, um, hitting a lot of the who, what, where, when, why, uh, a lot about standards, a lot about federal requirements, uh, some international requirements. So I think at this point, uh, we may be able to turn it over and take a, see if there's any questions. Dave, you got any questions? Yeah, there's a few here, so I'm going to start off like we've done with everything here and uh, going to put a poll on the screen for you guys, I'll give you about 30 seconds. Uh, we are giving out a, a prize at every one of these, a randomly selected who get the question right. So this should be a gimme. Uh, you're going to have a couple seconds here, and uh, and then we'll take some questions.
So it looks like some people weren't paying attention, but that's okay. Uh, the question was, uh, is a microwave considered a cooking appliance? And 88% uh, said no. So somebody was paying attention, Brian. Um, All right. <laughs> so the first question we had come in is, autos have a VIN that is visible to all. There is also a number with a location that is only known to law enforcement. Is this the case with HINs on vessels? Or Craig, Craig, do you want to take that one? Yeah, the 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 CFR uh, gives some uh, options of where you can place the exposed HIN. Uh, not all boats have a transom today, so it's quite popular to put that uh, visible one at the hull deck joint on the hull, just uh, forward of the back of the boat, so the law enforcement officer doesn't have to stick his head under the swim platform and get his hair wet to see it but there is requirements for a hidden one. And it's usually underneath some item, item of hardware or upholstery inside the boat. Uh, those are kept uh, secret by the boat manufacturer. Uh, and as a builder, I would get those calls regularly and always had to confirm it was a law enforcement officer that was asking for that hidden location. But yes, uh, really internationally, uh, you need a hidden HIN uh, within the craft, underneath some hardware, fitting upholstery uh, that's not easily detectable, and uh, keep that location to yourself unless someone in authority uh, gives you uh, reasons to tell them where it's at. All right, the next question is, uh, engines are marked with horsepower, not thrust. The requirement for engine cutoff is in thrust. What would be equivalent horsepower for the specific thrust requirement? Do you know that off the top of your head, Craig? I, I want I want to say yeah. uh, I, it, I know I've asked the engine manufacturers, and um, it, it's going to vary depending on the performance of the device, whether it's uh, an electric trolling motor, uh, electric outboard, or uh, something top. To I can't answer that specifically sitting here because there is some variation. We're going to have you'd have to confirm the type of propulsion that your uh, product is set up for, uh, what you're advertising it for, and confirm with the engine manufacturers uh, what they're getting out of 115 pounds of thrust. It's, that 115 is used within uh, other requirements in Coast Guard, like start in gear requirements. Uh, those are at that same level, but it is gonna potentially vary depending on the type of propulsion system. All right, another question here. Have you ever considered changing aquatic invasive species, AIS, to invasive aquatic species so as not to confuse it with the navigation AIS? Uh, yeah, so this, this is Brian. I think that's, you know, that's a, that's a really nice suggestion. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't coin that phrase. We kind of inherited it from the resource management community. Uh, they've been dealing with this for a long, long time, and, and it is, uh, it's a common, I think it's a common acronym that could be easily confused, um, but that's the language they use in the uh, resource management community, so it makes it a little bit, a little bit difficult to try to change uh, their vernacular. Right. Uh, the next question, I'll just answer it real quick. They asked about the presentation being available. Yes, it'll be posted on our YouTube page uh, tomorrow. So uh, look out for that. It'll That link will also be in your follow-up email. Um, so it looks like we don't have any questions left here and we're toward the end of our time. Uh, so Brian and Craig, do you have anything else to add or? No, just uh, the fact that uh, if you have details, questions, interpretations that you are uh, desiring, feel free to reach out to Brian or myself. You see our numbers and our contact information there on the screen, and we're available to support you uh, anytime. Thank you for your time. Yep. Appreciate everyone coming out. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone uh, once again for coming out. Uh, like I said, the video will be posted on our YouTube page tomorrow. So if you're watching that, you can get CEU credit at the very end. Um, if you're watching it live, you will get CEU credit uh, will be applied. Uh, you can apply for that rather in a link that's going to come in the automated follow-up email. 
So keep a lookout for that. And any questions, you could also reply to the uh, registration and whatnot. So I uh, hope everyone has a good week and staying safe. And we will see you next Thursday.